I've seen incredible changes in my lifetime. I've seen small calculators change into computers, into handheld phones, mobile phones, every form of communication, tiny cameras, the way people travel, the way people fly the airplanes, have they changed from domestic travel to the what luxury travel we have today. It's just a complete, utter change of the world. It's all happened after the war. My name is Peter Clark. And uh, I came from England originally. I was born in 1922, which was a 94 years ago. <laughs> Life in those days, but it was very hard in England because we didn't have refrigerators, we didn't have air conditioning. We had to chop wood for logs of fires. But very few people had cars. We got around mainly by bus, bicycles. The unemployment was absolutely enormous in England. Life was very, very severe up until about 37, 38 things started to pick up. I took a job in a place called Radio Rentals. This was just before the war. I was only there for a few months. They used to transmit radio via the telephone lines in England. I had a job there helping do the installations and also announcing the weather or time or various things in the studio, but that terminated about six months, that's all. But that was my first introduction actually to, to, to radio and technology. Yes, yes, I did have a grounding in it. I joined the RAF in 1940, but I was a flat mechanic. I was in the Battle of Britain on the frontline squadron. Oh, it was horrific. And we were bombed and shelled every day. And my job was to look after two or three Spitfires and prepare them for battle. And we hopefully they came back. A hell of a lot of them didn't come back. We lost so many, so many planes and pilots. And that was my training in 1940. The end of 1940, when the Battle of Britain finished, I was sent to a bomber squadron. And I was still doing a flight, me flight mechanic. And I changed over to a, fl a flight engineer after numerous places around the world. I flew in Blommers and we had a crash which unfortunately grounded me. The Prime Minister of the day, I think it was Curtin, requested from Churchill, send me some troops immediately because the Japanese are coming down and Churchill said, I can't because all my troops are in the Middle East and we need them there. And he said, look, if you don't do that, I'll bring them back. And Churchill said, no, we can't, can't do that. He said, I'll send you a squadron which we're sending off to Burma. And we were turned around and we came to Australia. Marvellous. <laughs> okay, I came to Australia in, in 19, the end of 1944. When the war, war finished in 1945, Governor General of the day offered asking any members of our squadron if they'd like to stay here, take the discharge in Australia. And when I heard the terms, I was stunned because there was a university education. It was, I think, some housing in it. In my case, he gave the free trip back to England for two years if I didn't like it here. And I thought, well, be nuts if I didn't, <laughs> if I went back amongst all the millions of servicemen in England trying to get jobs, so no, I stayed here. Yes, I came out of the Air Force as a sergeant flight engineer. I didn't really become interested in electronic technology, in anything at all, until I left the Air Force. From there on, I started business here, but the most incredible business I started was Magnetic Sound Industries, and that came about because I took a job as a rep for wire recorders. I'd never heard of wire recorders before. They are the first recording implement that the Allies captured, or the Americans captured from the Germans, and turned them into a domestic wire recorder for speeches and things like that. We knew such a thing was available in Germany because because Hitler used to make speeches, and instead of being in Munich one day, he could have been in Berlin the next day, just about off another day. The Allies were wondering how the devil he could possibly be there. The Americans, later in the war, captured the bar recorder, and of course the patents and everything else, and then that's how we knew about it. The wire was as thin as a human hair, it's just incredible. It was so thin and fine, it had two spools, one spool fed to the other spool, and if it broke at any time, we had to knot it together and trim the ends for it to go through the heads, recording heads, and the spools usually lasted about two hours, so you could do up to two hours recording. And the sound quality was very good, as a matter of fact, quite, quite very passable. And that's when I got bought this wire recorder, and that opened up a field to me which I'd never obviously heard of before, and I realised the, the huge potential of this sort of thing. I stayed there a few months, learned all about what made wire recorders tick. I could see the business side of it, yes, for speeches and for weddings and all sorts of things like that. And I could also see sales of these things, providing they came down in weight, because they weighed 40 pounds, and it was a dreadful way to be carrying around and I started off recording speeches. I recorded speeches for Robert Menzies, weddings, events. Well, Sir Robert Menzies 
wasn't Sir Robert Menzies in those days. Robert Menzies in those days, I thought, was a fabulous Prime Minister. I didn't have any much to do with him, but I recorded speeches for him and recorded some of the members of Parliament. This isn't the first referendum campaign that I've got uh, mixed up with, but I never come into one without being very much struck by one fact, and that is that a referendum campaign seems to be a rather dull sort of thing. If we had a general election on, this hall would be crowded to the rafters. Rude remarks would be made from all the corners. People's blood would run hot. Rude remarks also? Rude and crude, sir. I accept both the suggestions. I'm familiar at the receiving end with both of them. But when it comes to a referendum about altering the constitution of the country, I'm afraid that a great number of us say, oh, well, what, what's this all about? And what is the constitution anyhow? I possibly could have been one of the first to make film in those days for the parliament and they were going to use them for marketing. I don't know why I suppose that would be the first marketing type of ad advertising in those days. Uh, we were recording talent shows. Uh, this particular talent show was well known all over Australia. It was called Stone's Milk Bar in Coogee and most of the aspiring actors or singers of the day, everybody went through there and I used to record these people on my wire recorder and then we used to cut 78 acetate recordings and sell them 10 shillings each. So I started business off with my own wire recorder well, in, a, in a place actually in George Street, the radio theatre in George Street and turned that into offices with timber and cardboard frames and things. I had no money in those days and I sold one here, sold one there. And that started me off in business as Netic Sound Industries, starting around 52 right the way through to 1978. The wire recorder was so heavy, weighed 40 pounds, and it was terribly inconvenient, such a, a delicate thing, you couldn't store it. And if you snagged the wire, well, you, you, it was very difficult. But it was only a matter of two years. It didn't last very long, lost their popularity very quickly because tape recorders came in and they were easy to edit and the sound quality was even better again and they were silent and they were, and they were very light too. They only weighed 10 pounds, 15 pounds, something like that. And that's where I started building my business up on tape recorders and then from tape recorders into hi-fi equipment. Well, the introduction of tape recorders and tape itself from BASF, that was a German organization which should make the tape, was gigantic and that was being exported all over the world, exported all over Australia and tape recorders became practically de rigueur in every office or factory, anywhere where the spoken word was needed. I think I was the first company to sell tape recorders commercially in Australia, yes. So I, I was retailing. I, I was probably one of the first retailers. Well, I, I opened a, sh a shop in George Street. The first shop I fitted out like a boutique. I had a lovely yellow carpet down and I had cabinets to contain to tape recorders and things like that. But of course, it didn't take long for dirty, greasy boots coming across the place and it, I had to change that decor very quickly indeed. But tape recorders became one of the biggest sellers probably in the whole of the electronic industry. Everybody wanted a tape recorder because from tape recorders to the portables, they came down to hand size then, pocket size. From tape recorders, we went into hi-fi, which again, boosted the business. So we were known as the tape recorder and hi-fi specialists. In fact, we're the only retailers in the early, late 50s and the early 60s where we sold tape recorders and then hi-fi amplifiers came in and speakers and we had our own service department. But at one stage, we actually made our own speakers. In fact, you're making our own speakers too. Actually, I, I had an advertising agent. He advised me to use my face because he said people will get to know you. He advised me what to do. I should put my face in the, in, in the, on, tele, on, on, on my ads and we should build up a very personal business. And that's how it all came about. We used to make our own 30 second TV ads. And I have two sons, Adrian and Julian, and uh, they used to both appear in the television advertising with me. And they were very humorous. And then we built the business up very strongly with the two boys. I think we used in my name, yes, Peter Clark of Magnetic Sound Industries. So it became synonymous with the name. Hmm. Dick Smith lived opposite me and he expressed a desire to know a little bit more about electronics. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, Dick, I'll bring you some component parts back. Might be a broken wire tape recorder or some bits. We oh, said, I'd love that. So I brought these things home and gave them to him. He would have been about 10 or 12 or something the days I lived in Reservoir. And he used to put them together or make things out of them. And that started him off in his career from the field of electronics. Yes, he said, I gave him the idea of how to start electronics. So when he left school, apparently, that's what he started. I didn't see a great deal of him because we moved very shortly after that. But later on, I realized he had started a business which would have been 
what, about 10 years later, I suppose. Did exactly the same as I did. He liked the idea of calling himself Dick Smith Electronics, the same as I did Peter Clark Magnetic Sound Industries, because it has a very fi- very strong retail ring to it, too. Well, to use my name, same as Dick Smith has, makes it personal, and people remember who you are, rather than just being something, something, something shop. I think the personal name in business is very, very important. Well, Dick Smith was selling mainly parts and accessories for the electronic industry, which I wasn't in at all. My business was selling tape recorders, amplifiers, turntables, hi-fi, and all the accessories, reels of tape, microphones, earphones, all that sort of thing that went with that style of industry. His was in a totally different thing. It was sort of the first DIY electronics. Oh, I think Dick Smith got the idea of building that business up in exactly what I was doing, but not in the same field, but doing it in a completely different fashion of selling component parts for the DIY market, which had never occurred to me but that's what he did and built up a huge business so he literally opened in competition but selling totally different articles he was selling component parts but I was selling the full hi-fi hi- systems and tape recorders well we were in George Street right up, up until the late 60s but the rents started getting too high so I had to look around for cheaper premises Rock Street presented itself in a very very smart basement down a few steps and we opened a huge showroom there and I found York Street trading at a fraction of the rent, equally as powerful as being in George Street. Yeah, well, Dick Smith opened his store at the other end of York Street. I was horrified. (laughs) I think I was at about 72 or something like that. Not quite sure the actual dates, but I was horrified. (laughs) But uh, good luck to him anyway. I thought it was an enterprising young fellow. (laughs) It actually made me feel quite proud, the fact that somebody else got the idea from me. We used to advertise very strongly in Radio and Hobbies, which was one of the electronic hobby magazines in those days. I think that was again in the 60s, 70s, yes, mainly 60s. And Dick Smith used to advertise it also, as many, many other companies did. Magnetic Sound Industries was a highly successful business for many years until, of course, co- competition came in. And obviously, you had to fight a lot harder to get keep business going. But I had it mostly on my own through the 60s. But I... I stayed in it until 1978. Hi-Fi retail industry was taking a bad dip. For the sole reason, people were coming in with wholesale selling in the sense they used to buy them just in boxes and everything else. So they'd go around to see Peter Clark. He will give you a demonstration and come back and buy it from me and I'll give you 20 or 30% discount on it. So that more or less made it not worth staying in. There's no reason on earth why the, the industry went down at all, or my industry went down. It's for the sole reason more, more enterprising younger people were coming in, selling them as they are selling today, in boxes without any demonstration at all, just selling them as a box of hi-fi or, or tape recorders, whatever they might have been. After seeing demonstrations, they <laughs> my shop. <laughs> Dick Smith possibly was one of them too. Ta- tape recorders were used mainly, as far as I can see, people wanted to train their own voice. They wanted to record other people's voices surreptitiously or otherwise. They wanted to use them for they them for conferences. They used them for messages in stores. They used them for anything where spoken word had to come out to the public. Later in the years, advertising was very strong with them. They used them in shops for advertising. Hmm. I think the sex industry used to use them a lot. <laughs> but wiretapping and, and hidden microphones and tiny microphones were coming in in the late 70s, middle 70s actually, and they were a devastating field really because I think it changed people's lives and ruined people's lives in Australia. I, I, I wouldn't touch them personally. In espionage, tape recorders and, and the small wire recorders in those days, or the handheld ones or the pocket ones now, were being used everywhere. In fact, you wouldn't know whether you're being recorded or not. Rather like today, things haven't changed that much since those years. I had an apartment, rented an apartment in King's Cross Road, and unbelieved, unbeknown to me, there was a couple there we just say hello to, Russians, and they turned out to be the Petrovs. <laughs> That's all I knew, knew about them. <laughs> I was interested in television, and then when television advertising came in, I was more fascinated with that because I knew that's an industry, I could see that was an industry that I should be in. A few years later, started a television advertising company. I started Gold Coast TV Advertising Network, where we make television commercials and buy airtime and put people on local television. Well, after the war, the the world changed so dramatically, it changed people's lives from the very ordinary, shall we call it, into the most exciting times where people could ever experience. In in every field, it wouldn't matter from travel, uh, communication, housing, furniture, just everything changed. And it gradually came every year, every year, every two years, new and newer things came in. And over over the 50 years, I would say we have 
Australia has been come to the most progressive country, I think, perhaps in the world. Basically, the history of Peter Clark and Australia.